Hi everyone, I'm Peter Askim. I'm the artistic director of the next Festival of Emerging Artists and I'm so excited to welcome you to our season finale. It's been a really interesting season but really fantastic. So the festival is um, a festival designed for early career artists from age 20 to age 30. These are string players, composers, choreographers, and what we try and do is give them all of the tools to succeed in the music business. So whether that's artistic things or uh, like financial workshops or entrepreneurial talks and mentorships. And so we've been going since 2013. And this year obviously was a big challenge for everybody, as you know, but we wanted to jump right in right away. Uh, so since March, we've been presenting two events a week bringing in great artists to do talks, master classes, and for the four, last four weeks, we've been doing a full-on festival, two days a week. Lots of great artists. We've presented over 35 artists since March, and one of our priorities is to pay our artists. So we uh, have asked you all to make a small donation, um, and that way we can keep doing this. So I'm very, very excited about this finale of the festival. We have three components to it. Um, three hours coming up. Uh, next, right in an hour, is Richard Thompson, the legendary singer, songwriter, guitar player, founder of Fairport Convention, and all around genius guy. Uh, at at uh, eight o'clock, eight o'clock is a focus on our collaborative projects. So we wanted to do some things which were not just staring at a Zoom screen. So I think you'll be really interested to see the creative solutions that our students and artists have come up with. So um, I wanted to start off with an amazing violinist and social justice classical music entrepreneur. She's um, an incredible artist and also dedicated to bringing music to the homeless through her, her organization, um, Music Kitchen. So she can tell you all about her career path because I think it's a very interesting one. And I think that we can all kind of uh, learn from the interesting twists and turns that people take these days to get to careers and how they can make uh, a great impression on the, the field. So without further ado, um, I wanna really welcome Kelly to be our first part of our uh, season finale. Hey Kelly. Great to see Hi, you. Hi, Peter. Great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. And it's great to see all of you. It's great to be here. Uh, I would love to see more of all of you. I think a lot of people have their video off, but I would love to see your faces if you feel like turning it on at some point. But anyway, as, I, as Peter introduced, I'm here to speak mostly to the students. Um, I'm so grateful to have people, uh, some guests here to support me as well, and um, thereby supporting the next Festival of Emerging Artists. Um, but you will bear with me as I direct many of my comments, most of my comments to the students, and, um, but I hope that there will be something for everyone. So first off, I just want to start out by saying uh, I am aware that it is a spectacularly challenging time for me to be presenting a talk on career paths. And uh, it is not lost on me, that fact, and we will be addressing the pandemic, so don't worry about that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my life's journey and my career. Not that you will have similar um, choices and, and, and paths and, and interests, you will have your own unique interests and path. But I'm hoping that in sharing some of the details of my, my journey, um, some of the things that I've learned along the way will help you as you navigate your own journey. Um, for example, the major themes that I kind of want to touch on by going through some of my life is my transition from uh, the paradigm of working really hard and waiting for great things to happen to working really hard and creating great things to happen. Um, I wanna talk about coming back from big disappointments to create things bigger than the thing that disappointed you. I wanna talk today about um, persevering with your unique ideas through lots and lots of no's and I wanna talk about while you're doing all of that to give back to your community, even when things are not assured for yourself. So how many of you, I'm just curious before I start, how many of you have chamber music groups that you intend to make or that you have made or intend to make professional ventures? Anyone out there? Okay, a few people, great. 
Well, you know, when I started, I had the most traditional education. I went to um, really fantastic schools and had wonderful teachers. I started with Charlie Castleman and Glenn Dictorow. And even though I went to, uh, I started with Charlie and, I, and he's the one who created the quartet program. And I went there, um, but still at the time that I was at Eastman, I remember looking longingly at the people who established chamber groups. They would pair off and then they would decide that they were gonna make it as a professional group. And I thought, well, that just didn't, that didn't just happen to me. Like it just happened not to be my path. It must not be for me. And then I think I was, um, I love the orchestra, but I think rather than a choice, it felt more like um, an inevitability that I found myself on a path to an orchestral career. It seemed like the only logical sense, you know, uh, sensical thing to do. And so I went to the prestigious orchestral performance program for my master's at the Manhattan School of Music, studying with Glenn Dictorow, the concert master of the New York Philharmonic. And I did very well there. I was, I auditioned and became concert master of both the school orchestras. And then while I was also in school, I became runner up at the New York Philharmonic. Um, it was widely assumed that I might go on to win the New York Philharmonic audition. It didn't happen. Uh, despite a couple of really great auditions and at least one dud, it did not happen. However, shortly thereafter, I did win an, an audition for another major orchestra in three rounds, totally behind the screen. Um, however, at the end of that process, which by the way was an objective numbering system, where above this threshold you win and below this threshold you don't, I was above the threshold. But after that whole process of three blind rounds, the orchestra actually contacted me with a six week delay and said, and I quote, the music director is not interested in hiring you. I was devastated. And I even manifested, I think from the stress of it, um, a repetitive playing motion injury for a year that it took me to get over where I never had that sort of problem before. But shortly thereafter, I was in such great audition shape. I um, won the audition for the New Jersey Symphony immediately after that. And it allowed me, it was a job that allowed me to stay in New York City, which I never, I love New York, but I had always envisioned getting an orchestra job and moving someplace else. Um, but this job was not quite one of the big orchestra full-time 52 week seasons. So it did two things. It allowed me to stay in New York and it gave me a little bit of st stability, you know, being recently out of school. But it started to do some other things, which I will talk about in just a minute. Um, Cause I never really intended to stay in that position. I always envisioned myself moving on to a 52 week orchestra job. Um, but what I wanna talk about a lot is the, the skills that we can gain from wherever we are along the way. So here's some of the skills that I gained by being in the New Jersey Symphony. The, the, the obvious ones, of course, um, I learned the orchestral repertoire beyond the audition process, which is a whole different thing. I learned the orchestral repertoire in practice so that all of the big works were like, um, you know, they were treasured old friends. And I got to play season after season where I knew these works really, really well. That's the obvious stuff. Um, the less obvious stuff, I got to, I learned how an orchestra functions in the community. I learned about fundraising in an orchestra and what happens when major events happen like 9-11. I learned about the contract negotiation process, how that works, how it breaks down. I learned how boards work with orchestras, what they understand, what they don't understand about what we do, all those kinds of things. And then another completely unexpected skill that I learned from being in an orchestra, public speaking. Um, I was, uh, the orchestra kept trying to ask me to do these speeches in front of the, in front of the orchestra at concerts. In the beginning, I was like, oh, no, 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 I, I don't wanna do that. But then one day we were playing Mendelssohn Reformation Symphony and they said, can we interview you on stage about growing up Lutheran? I said, oh, sure. <laughs> and so I learned something really important. And that is that speaking about something that you have interest and passion and knowledge about, that's easy. Public speaking, as I thought of it, was hard. I became a public speaker. So very soon after, um, the, the orchestra actually gave me free reign to talk about the program 
uh, in front of the audience, in front of 3,000 people every, at every concert for a couple of years, um, I did that. And another, um, I think one of the things that also started to happen during my time in the orchestra was because I had this place of, um, you know, stability and, and relative comfort of a semi full-time job, I also started to get back to the things that I have been doing for years, the, the independent projects, the solo concertos and recitals and that kind of thing, pardon me. And um, part of what I wanna tell you about is the track of my career through CDs, through recordings, because I think it says an awful lot about the trajectory that I have taken. And the first recording that I made was just a kind of a, a test balloon, as I call it. I had gotten a, a, a small grant from $5,000 grant from the Mellon Foundation um, through the Mellon Foundation. Uh, so I got a grant from the New Jersey Symphony through uh, the Mellon Foundation. And that allowed me to do my first CD, my debut CD. That didn't quite cover it. So I covered the, I produced the rest of the disc. And I learned very quickly um, when I put that out into the world that lots of great opportunities came. Um, one of those was my being soloist with the Dallas Symphony, um, several other concert engagements. So that sort of got me to thinking. And it was a few years later that I embarked on my second disc um, in my own voice. And that one is the first one that I actually worked on and tried to market to um, to record companies because this test balloon had been so successful. So I remember recording this disc of seven different works and reaching out to record companies and they were like, well, we don't do, we don't do recital discs. And I was like, what's a recital disc? Well, like, well, you did like multiple composers. We just want a disc with all one composer. And I said, well, that's not what I want to do. And they're like, well, we don't, we don't produce recital discs. So I said, okay, you know, and, um, and then, uh, I actually got a call, uh, one, of the, one of the places that I sent it to was EMI Classical. I don't know if any of you know that label from before. They no longer in business, but they, they actually called me the day, the last day that they were in business, just to say how much they enjoyed my recording. Um, and if they were going to continue, they would have produced it. That was really wonderful for me, but we obviously did not do that. So I found a label that I could produce that project with and skip ahead until, you know, um, more recently, that disc is now in the Smithsonian Museum of, of African American History. So I'm really proud of where that went. But I want to take a little bit of a, of a gap in recordings um, to tell you about another thing that um, I think many of us, uh, if you were like me, you probably have spent a lot of time thinking that a manager could solve all of your problems. How many people have ever kind of thought of that? Yeah. So I, <laughs> Bruce, um, so I actually, uh, in the pursuits of management that I have had over my career, I did at one point land one of the top management companies in the classical music business worldwide. And I was really excited to be with that company. I had concerts for about five years um, in collaboration with other folks and a few solo things of my own. And um, I thought that was it. I thought I was set. Uh, but then, as it turns out, my manager was so excited to, <clears throat> to build his portfolio that he went a little too far for the company's comfort. And he went from four artists to 32. And suddenly, the company just said, you know what? It's to bridge too far. We need you to cut. And so I, along with 28 other artists, were cut from the roster. I thought it was the worst thing ever. And I just didn't see how I was going to get past it. Fortunately, at the same time, I was also thinking of leaving my orchestra job, which was anathema. I remember hearing Oprah say something once when I was considering leaving an orchestra job to pursue my passion, um, which is solo playing beyond the or in front of the orchestra. I remember something that Oprah said once, and I was hoping to God it was not true. She said, you have to jump first and then the parachute appears. You don't wait for the parachute and then jump. It doesn't work like that. The universe doesn't work, doesn't respond like that. 
the universe responds to your initiative and you're taking a risk. And I was like, oh my God, I hope that's not true. And I said that for years. Well, finally, one day I thought, you know what? It must be true. I took the leap. And the first thing that happened was I lost my management and I thought, what have I done? <laughs> but at the same time, I had this creative project that I wanted to do. And I just went for it. Um, I remember that releasing my second disc, there was a change in the industry whereby CDs were kind of going out of, you know, production and nobody's really listening to CDs. And so I thought I want to do something radically different anyway. And I decided I wanted to record music videos. And I decided I want to record a big, hard, you know, violin virtuoso piece. And then something totally, totally, um, you know, a little silly and, and lighthearted and, and uh, so that people can see that violinists are not all serious, but we can also be fun in games. And I wanted to use that to draw a large audience. Um, I wanted to let you know that when I was having that idea and trying that project, I realized I needed to work with a publicist to help me tell the story. I interviewed 20 publicists. 19 of them said no. They said, we only do real recordings. We don't do YouTube. Like, no, what is this? YouTube, no. Um, and so the one person that would work with me on this, you know, helped me to get it out in front of the world. And I'm really happy to say that my imagination project has gotten over a million and a half views. Um, and so I want to show you just a little bit of that. And I'll show you both the serious one and the not so serious one just a little, a little bit of each. So bear with me just a moment. <laughs> not quite as serious as Isai solo sonata number six. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to put that out into the world and just sort of shake things up. And as I said, it really created a stir. I got a million and a half views all over the world from Japan to Brazil to, you know, the Netherlands to Sydney, Australia, just everywhere. And it was really, really exciting. In addition to that, it also created one of my next positions uh, that I was able to play professionally. But before I get to the next thing, I would actually like to back up in time um, to my creation of Music Kitchen Food for the Soul. So I was playing and preparing for solo concerts and looking for an audience to share that with one day when I played for um, the homeless shelter clients at the church shelter where I volunteered. And to make a long story short, I, when I played for them incidentally, it sort of brought together a lot of different life experiences. And I realized 
that all of the concert life that I'm playing around the world is completely inaccessible to this entire group of people that are currently experiencing homelessness. Um, and that I wanted to do something to change that, to make the, the great inspiration and the transcendent power of music available to everyone. So in 2003, uh, sorry, 2005, I created Music Kitchen Food for the Soul. And since that time, uh, we have played over 100 concerts and engaged over 200 artists, people including like Man Emmanuel Axe and um, Albrecht Meyer of the Berlin Philharmonic and Glenn Dichtero and many, many, many wonderful emerging artists like Terrence Wilson, Alexis Gerlach, Claire Chase, some really great folks, a Brazil guitar duo, a lot of really great artists. And um, we have gone into, I think, nearly 30 shelters um, from New York to Los Angeles and even in Paris, France. And um, it has been a profoundly moving experience for me and the other artists and to see, you know, the reactions from the, the shelter clients is for some of us actually, um, you know, kind of a, a stronger um, connection to an audience than we sometimes experience in the concert hall. And it's rather extraordinary. And um, so I want to talk a little bit more about Music Kitchen, but first I'm going to go back and tell you about the next um, the result of the next disc. And that is um, from, or the previous disc, the Imagination Project. The next project that that actually inspired was my time on Broadway. Um, I spent 18 months on Broadway, 13 months as the fiddler, the actual violin soloist for Fiddler on the Roof. Now, having come from completely traditional roots, um, I had always avoided Broadway. It was not something that I had ever intended to do for myself. Um, but, but being invited to do that rather singular role and in that unique way, having solos that were created for me, um, it was one of the most incredible growth periods, um, I think, of my playing and of my life. Um, so recapping some of the skill levels or some of the skills that I gained from um, from all of these experiences. In Broadway, we don't really think of that so much as the same business as classical music. And in fact, it's very different in, in a variety of ways. During the pandemic, we've learned actually that Broadway is a $14 billion industry um, that is uh, you know, a higher grossing industry than the top 10 sports teams in New York combined. So that's what the, you know, the economy in New York is missing right now. But as a player who could play on Broadway, here's something really interesting that I was able to, to glean from that experience. Um, name something in classical music that can do this, which basically we did on Broadway. Play the same piece of music in the same theater, in the same city, 400 consecutive nights in a row with a 50% or greater, 50 to 100% filled capacity. I think there's something extraordinary about the Broadway business model that I was able to learn by being in the midst of it. I think classical music can learn from that. One of the other experiences that I, one of the other things I learned from being on Broadway um, was being a soloist every night of the week. It's a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, Broadway, as I said, is very big business. There's lots of um, you know, different entities that have an interest in the success of the endeavor. And the first sound and the last sound and many, many ones in between in that particular production were me alone in the theater. Um, so from that experience, I think some of my artistic growth was the greatest in my career to date. So that when I did other things like do the US premiere of the Siegfried Matus Violin Concerto, I think it was one of my best performances of a concerto. Um, so that was an unexpected gain. So moving backward just a bit for some of the skills and the things that I've talked about so far, the videos, there were skills involved in uh, recorded the recording process, the audio recording process, and now a video recording process with a team of videographers and cinem cinematographer. 
allocating time budgets, at, you know, setting and allocating recording spending budgets, um, finding locations, location insurance, finding props, creating a set, all of those different elements that come together and their skills that you learn along the way when you do a project like that. And with Music Kitchen, even more so, um, running, founding and running an organization, raising money, fundraising, uh, contracting over you know, hundreds of artists, contracting with city agencies, contracting with um, uh, the shelter agencies, and so on and so on and so on. So many skill levels that I picked up in all of those things. And keep in mind that when I started Music Kitchen, I wasn't exactly where I wanted to be in my own professional career just yet. But these are still valuable skills that I, that I learned along the way. Um, so going back to Broadway, um, this experience was for me so incredibly transformational and so incredibly rewarding that I decided that eight shows a week were not enough. <laughs> and I decided to do yet another recording project and inspired by that experience. So I commissioned and wrote the first ever Fiddler solo album um, called The Fiddler Expanding Tradition. And that came from my first arrangement, which was a solo violin version of If I Were a Rich Man. And then I worked with the creative team of our production to uh, create and do the other arrangements. So that's another skill that I, um, that I added to my skill set, both for the Imagination Project and the Fiddler Expanding Tradition, and that is in arranging slash composition. Um, so I want to play another snippet or two of a couple of the videos um, that came out of that project. Now that's a little bit of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, um, all this discussion of these projects, um, self-initiated projects, I want to talk now a little bit about um, money and budgeting. So if I had waited for Deutsche Grammophone to call me up to do these projects, I'd still be waiting. <laughs> so the question is, how does one do that kind of thing? And I, wanted, I want to talk about something um, that musicians don't maybe think as much about early in our careers. And that is, in fact, it's another thing that Oprah said. And that is pay yourself first. Create a habit of saving money all the time. No matter how little of it you have, it's a percentage, not an amount. Um, so that 
I think we're living, you know, I'm showing you projects that are an example of why that is important. And I think on the other, the other end of the scale, we are living a time that shows why that is important. For all reasons, save money. Um, and then you, you have a, a base from which to uh, create and place your work in the world. Now, I'm not going to um, say that that's the only philosophy. There are different philosophies about how to get a project underway. And I definitely could argue um, in the other respect that, um, that self-funding big projects can definitely take funding away from other things that you need to do in your life. There's definitely a consideration there. I think it may have delayed my ability to own property and that sort of thing. So, um, but it's my personal philosophy that if you can have the capital to start your projects and hopefully finish them, it's the best chance that you have of bringing your ideas into the world. So I think that something that's really important, whether it's project oriented or disaster you know, related, really important to pay yourself first. You get so used to it, you don't even think about it anymore. It becomes a habit. Um, it's something to start as early as possible for your um, you know, for creative projects, for your financial safety, um, safety net, and for your retirement. Just those are things that it's good to think about as, you know, even when you don't think you make that much money, um, or when you do, you, you'd be shocked at how quickly you get accustomed to that habit. So again, Oprah was right. <laughs> Pay yourself first. However, a project as big as the one that I just showed you, um, I personally, put a lot of money into it, but there's no way I could have actually funded that on my own in the way that I did it, in the timing that I did it. Fortunately, it happened to also coincide with uh, the fact that I won the Sphinx Medal of Excellence, which came with a $50,000 grant. Um, hugely instrumental in doing that project and, and still yet not enough. So um, not all projects are of that scale, um, but with so many moving parts, commissioning, um, videography, recording, makeup, location, all of those things come into play. Um, so it's helpful. The other thing that's really helpful for you to learn as early as possible is learn the language and culture of grant writing. I have all, I, I, have, I spent most of my life feeling like grants were a foreign language and I just, I still feel that way. You can, you can spend so much time writing what you think is a really great proposal and uh, just, you know, get completely um, turned down in and, and ways that we never will understand. It's just, these are the ways of the universe. But uh, learning the culture um, and the timing and the schedule of grants is really, really important. Some grants you can apply for every year. One, I'll tell you a free one right now. If, how many of you live in Manhattan? Okay, at least one person. <laughs> for people who live in Manhattan, uh, there is a there's a grant every year and the deadline is coming up from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. You do not have to live in Lower Manhattan. It's just based in Lower Manhattan. You have to live in Manhattan and you have to do a public component to your project, at least one public component that is in Manhattan. Aside from that, you're open to do other things. So anyway, that's that's one thing if you want to research. Um, you know, yourself or all or part of your group, any, any one person that applies for, uh, for that must live in Manhattan. Okay, so I wanna go, on, go back to Music Kitchen. And um, so in all of these years of doing these great concerts for the homeless, we just uh, arrived this year in 2020 at our 15th anniversary. And for the 15th anniversary, I envisioned this again, large scale project um, to celebrate the nearly 30,000 shelter clients that we've reached over the years. So since the beginning, we've been collecting their freeform comments on colored note cards. And um, I've revered those slices of life and those heartfelt words for 15 years. And I've never had any visions of anything specific to do with them. But in looking to our 15th anniversary, I decided to create a project called Forgotten Voices. And I've engaged 15 top composers to choose among those comments and set them um, to music and uh, the song cycle, Forgotten Voices. I'm really super proud of the fact that we had this incredible rollout of that project. Um, 
for 15 months, starting in January of 2019, we premiered and we gave priority access to the shelter clients by premiering one song every month in the shelter first. And we were able to get through 14 of those live before the pandemic hit. We were supposed to have premiered the 15th work um, on March 30th. And of course, we all know how that ends. But even more so, we um, one of the proudest things in, in my career is that when I pitched this project to Carnegie Hall, they said, we want to be part of this. And um, they became a partner in the commission and also in co-presenting the world premiere of the complete song cycle. So bef uh, that was to have occurred um, on May 21st, this grand concert with Carnegie Hall. So I had just played as soloist with the Baltimore Symphony. I was supposed to play this really amazing concert at Carnegie Hall and also um, what's well, I have to just take a break to say, considering what we've just lived for the last several months, I think that it is so important that instead of leading straight into this concert, that the universe has instead kind of torn back the veil of uh, showing us the injustices for why such a concert is even necessary. So I just have to say that. I think that this is a really important delay and I'm totally fine with um, letting the world um, have, a, have a chance to really grapple with issues that I think need grappling with and solving and fixing and healing. And when we can all come back to that, I think um, the concert will be an important part of that healing process. Um, but I just want to, to let you know that obviously, and, and also I was supposed to have on a performance pro a professional level, I was supposed to have a really, um, fantastic and phenomenal solo engagement with a major orchestra also during this time. And that has, um, you know, has been interrupted by this. So trust me when I tell you, I know in a very real sense, um, the, the frustration and the challenge and the delay of the time that we're living. But here's what I want to tell you. Okay, so when I was on Broadway, that's a kind of a boon time, right? That's, that's a, a certain amount of measured time, but it's a boon time. I remember saying, I've seen lots of people get a Broadway show and they drink lots of lattes and they go to fancy dinners for six months, for a year, for two years or three years or five years or whatever it is. And then when it's all over, they, they don't necessarily have anything to show for it. I made a conscious decision. I do not want that to happen. I said, this show, I said very clearly to myself, this show is not gonna last forever, but when it's over, I want something concrete left behind. Um, and for me, that's this house. Um, you know, it, I didn't completely, you know, finish paying for a house um, on a Broadway show in 18 months, but I got several years into it because of that um, show and because of that intention. So with the pandemic, I say to you the same thing. This is not going to last forever, but when it's over, what will you have to show for it? This is time that we ordinarily wouldn't have. In, in very, very key ways. Um, there are projects that can be manifested. There are creative energies from this, um, from this experience. Um, think, of the, think of the Messiaen Quartet for the End of Time, written in a concentration camp in very, very dire circumstances and the piece that came to the world um, as a result of that experience. However, I, I'm gonna temper that by saying, this is, this is the big stuff. You know, what we are living right now, this is the biggest, this is as big as it gets. We're in a life and death struggle. struggle. So we have to remember that and be gentle with ourselves um, and each other. I think that's really important. But aside from that, in addition to that, when you, when you can allow for that, this is a really important time. This is not going to last forever. But when it's over, who will you be? as an artist, what will you have accomplished? What can you render? What have you, what, what creative energies have you spun into, um, you know, into your reality? Um, you know, what creative processes weren't possible six months ago that, that will now be um, engendered by this experience? 
So that's one of the things that I, I encourage you to think about this time that we're living. It's very frustrating. We've lost the ability to do what we do in the way that we're used to doing it. But there are opportunities here that we, you know, once we allow for the fact that we really do need to be gentle with ourselves, there are opportunities here in time and reflection um, in creativity that we may never have again. Um, it's a unique kind of, it's a unique kind of pause with a unique kind of perspective, a once in a generation <laughs> collection of all of those things. So I, I encourage you to sort of think of, think of it that way. Um, this particular, you, you are all, we, we could have done this particular gathering in, in person in one place, but think of the opportunities to reach more people. Um, in a lot of different places in, at once, then your one little concert in one little hall cannot accomplish. There are things, there, there are new paradigms to explore. And one of the ways we're doing that with Music Kitchen is a program called Bridging the Distance to continue giving our material to uh, the shelter clients. It's much more challenging. Many of them do have their own devices, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge. As I said, we are in a life and death struggle. This is the big stuff. Um, so we have to keep that in mind, but just keep in mind what, uh, what, what can you mine, M-I-N-E, from this time, from yourself. Okay, so with that, um, I think I, one thing I neglected to share with you that I want to just show you is the, um, the Forgotten Voices poster, which, you know, we will come back and we will do this, uh, this performance. And as I said before, when we do it, I think that it will be a really important part of the healing process that we experience collectively as a culture. And this is a little bit about what that is like. We have 15 composers and I added another skill to my skill set because I became one of them. And um, that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the poster for that event, which we will schedule as soon as possible. But I would like to leave you actually with the, speaking of paradigms, um, I would like to try to sneak in the full performance, the virtual performance of the 15th premiere, which we did all from quarantine in our homes. Um, you know, the, the song texts range in serious to tragic to, uh, to whimsical, and I would put this in the whimsical category. And I think it also kind of has a deeper message too. And I wonder if you will see it. So I'm gonna play that and then I'm gonna just share with you a few takeaways from today. Okay, this is Hooking In by Kamala Sankaram. The encore reminds me of a day of fishing. Fishing, all the things it entails, from moving from one fishing hole to another, to getting to that special spot, catching a small one, hooking in, and the drama of losing a potential big one, seeing the big one getting snagged on a log, hooking into the big one again, and eating it for dinner. Thank you. 
with a few takeaways before we do some questions. And hopefully you will be able to see them as well. There we go. Okay, number one, above all, do the things you're passionate about. Let that be the foundation of your decision making for your path. Every station in your career, uh, career path holds nuggets which inform and lead you to the next chapter if you recognize and use them that way. And Related to that, create and uh, collect and create a diverse skill set from your experience. Number three, reach for great artistry, not just great instrumental playing. Four, engage a diverse array of partners, including the composers on the scores. Number five, make a habit of saving and investing money, savings, retirement accounts, investments, as early as possible. Pay yourself uh, first, like Oprah said, to build for professional projects, safety net, retirement, etc. Six, learn the language, culture, and skill and calendar of grant writing. Seven, make a difference and contribute to your community along the way, even while you are trying to establish yourself and build your career. Number eight, see opportunity and creativity and new and unexpected paths. Number nine, look beyond only what somebody has already done to what they could do, potential collaborators, and people will look at you that way. And I think that's an important thing. Number 10, strive to be an artist that audiences trust no matter what new directions you take. Um, 11, work really hard and create the great things that happen. Don't wait for the great things to happen. 12, come back from disappointment to something bigger and better than the thing that disappointed you. 13, learn to persevere with your unique ideas through lots of no's. 14, there is not just one way to do anything. Find your unique path. And best of all, number 15, all of the above can happen during a pandemic. <laughs> so with that, I want to just open it up for some questions before we have to go. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Anyone? Uh, have any questions they would like to share? I see the chat has been robust. I haven't been following that so much, but Peter, or if anybody wants to raise a hand, that might be the fastest way, if I can see you. Yes, Shan Shanna. Shanna? Um, hi, it's my son. Hi. How are you? 
Good, how are you? Good. I would like to know how old you were when you started playing. You know what, that's something I used to feel very um, self-conscious about. I started when I was nine years old, which in our field, as we know, is considered old. <laughs> I used to think that until I was on an interview segment uh, one time on MSNBC with Misty Copeland. Does everybody know Misty Copeland, the great ballerina superstar? She started when she was 14 and she became professional uh, dancer like two years later. So I pretty much put that one to bed <laughs> for myself. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, Rachel. We had a specific question about what, it, what video editing software were you using for the, the, the commission piece? I did not do that myself. I, I asked a video editor to do that. Um, I try uh, just just you know, I tried acapella once and I was personally not happy with the results of this of the sound but I have seen other people use it uh, well and the other limitation of acapella is that you can only you can't bank a lot of different takes and then choose one you just sort of have to you know just decide you're going to take this one or whatever's behind door number three and I don't like working that way <laughs> but I may eventually if this goes on a long time I may do more in the video editing realm myself and not always engage someone to do it. What's my favorite solo violin piece and chamber music piece to perform? Ooh, wow, let's see. Um, well, chamber music piece, that's easy. I am absolutely smitten and in love with Brahms in general, um, but the Brahms G major string sextet is like heaven on earth. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, solo violin pieces, I think I really enjoy playing the Barber Violin Concerto, and I've done that. Actually, you can see a video on YouTube of me playing that with Keith Lockhart at Brevard on YouTube. Um, and um, gosh, I really like so many things. I like whatever I'm playing at the moment. I'm really one of those, I'm very generous with composers because I'm, you know, I'm not very judgmental. I have, I'm very opinionated, but I'm very generous. Um, and I tend to love whatever I'm playing. There are few few things that, that don't rise to that level, but I do have favorites, of course. Oh, thank you so much, um, Bobby, Keenan. thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Hi, Kelly, um, I'm Hiwan. Um, so I'm, think, I'm currently oh, a Hiwan. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm tuning in from Rochester, New York. Um, and Rochester? Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's been four years there. Is it snowing today? Oh, you're so funny. It could have been. <laughs> it's actually really hot and humid today. Um, oh, okay. My question is that I'm kind of, um, I really loved everything you said about um, today. Um, I just feel like it's really relevant and I'm also, it's also been a year of me being out of school. So um, just my question is how important do you think location plays into creativity and, you know, just like opportunities and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, you know, for me, I, I, I think it has been really an important piece. But as I said, there's no, there's not one way to do anything. You know, and from my perspective in my life, I wanted to leave Rochester after Eastman and come to New York. I, I knew I always want, I feel like I was born a New Yorker. I just was born in the South and I had the good sense to know that I probably shouldn't go there right away. So I went, you know, but I think that um, you have to do what calls you. And I think that our world is getting more global from, you know, obviously we're having this conversation right now and, and we're all, we are all kind of um, relegated to meeting the world in new ways. And I think because of that, some of that is never going to go away and that's a good thing. So I think that the benefit of most careers, I think our careers is not as, as typically on the list, but the benefit of, of many careers is that they can be done remotely to anywhere. And I think this situation is causing us to have to think differently. I do think that it is important to be in a place uh, where in normal times, if somebody calls you up and says, hey, uh, I'd like to discuss that project. Can we meet for coffee? that you can say, yes, let's do that, you know? I do think it's important, but not all of those partners have to be, that can be in Rochester also. 
Um, or now you know how to just call up people on Zoom and say, hey, let's talk that thing through face-to-face, -face, Zoom. Um, so I do think that location is important, but you can use your location to your advantage no matter what it is. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Kelly, we had one question um, that, that actually Bobby wanted to know. Uh, your advice list is, some, is really great. Is that something that you could share? Absolutely. I will send it to you. Uh, I'll, I will uh, save it as a PDF and send it to you and you can share it. Fantastic. We'll post that on our website. We have a, an archives and resources page of the website. So Sounds we'll put good. that up as soon as we get it. Great. I think Shauna has a question. Okay. Um, how, do you play any other instruments other than violin? Not really. No, I, I took required piano um, at Eastman. You know, my mom, who is on this call, actually tried to get me to play <laughs> piano when I expressed my interest. And in, I, I chose violin for myself. I fell in love with it. I think I was a violinist in another life. I swear, I must have been. I chose that easily, even at nine, a little bit late. But my mom seeing this, she was like, you should probably play the, take the piano. I was like, uh, I don't need that. I just want the violin. Then I get to Eastman and I had all of this required piano and here's me playing piano at the time. <laughs> so, you know, I've suffered through my piano audits and all that stuff. And I would have, I tested based on my level, I tested into what we used to call God theory um, but I could not actually place in that class because of my lack of piano skills. So I had to go to like human level high theory. Um, so, but now, you know, during quarantine, that's one of the things that um, I'm getting back to. And I sort of tinkered over the years a little bit here and there, but I'm actually happily, and I'm finding that I'm, I'm getting better so much faster than when I was in, in my undergraduate uh, days. It's, it's just assimilating much faster for me now, and I'm really psyched about that. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Thank you. I think, I think we can all tell your mom that you ended up okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kelly. This is like super, super great. Um, oh, thanks okay. for sharing so much with us and, and for spending the time and for all your generosity of spirit. Uh, I, think, I think everybody got a lot out of it. Um, and I'm so glad that it took a pandemic, but we finally connected and I'm yeah. glad to be connected. I can't wait for next time. Exactly. Well, it's really wonderful to see all of you and, and I'm so ha happy to know that this was helpful for you. And um, it's great to see your bright shining faces uh, where, you know, in your various quarantine locations. And I hope this is not the last time. I look forward to seeing your work and um, to connecting in a lot of different ways. And thank you so much again, Peter. It's been really, really wonderful to, um, to be part of the next Festival of Emerging Artists. Well, we'll have to have you on the next next festival. <laughs> yeah. The Uber next festival. The Uber next. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you.